The table is where life happens. It's where imagination runs wild. Where lessons are learned. And wonders are built. The table is where time can stop. Where wounds are comforted. And freedom begins. It's where we find peace. And we laugh till it hurts. The table is where we gather with family, new and old, to share stories, to nourish our bodies, to enrich our souls. The table is where we give thanks and where we remember what great gifts we have been given. And bring it all to the table. There's nothing he ain't seen before. For all your sin, all your sorrow, and your sadness. I want to welcome you guys, whether for the very first time or maybe you've been there many times, I want to welcome you to the table of God. And as we think about the table, really the centerpiece thing that happens here at the table, it goes by a whole bunch of names, doesn't it? We call it the Lord's Supper or Communion or the Eucharist or the Lord's Table or the Breaking of Bread. And and just like it has a whole bunch of names, there are all sorts of thoughts and opinions about what happens as we come to this table and what's going on and how we should participate in this and even who can and is allowed to participate And like I said last week, though, I'm not so sure that hungry people really care about all that stuff, right? It's only the fat and the full that get that nitpicky. And so while there are disagreements, right, and there certainly are a whole bunch of disagreements about what happens and who can come and who can't come, we're not going to spend any time there. In fact, last week we ended with two statements, right? One, there are always more leaves in God, for God's table, right? There's always more of these things. We can always make the table bigger. There's always space for everyone. We actually put an extra leaf in this table and made it bigger from last week. And then we said, the other thing we said is there are always more chairs at God's table. Because if you ever show up somewhere and there's a place for everyone else to sit, but there's no place for you, probably the length of time you're going to spend diminishes drastically, doesn't it? And at God's table, there's always more space. And I told you, this series was going to be 20 to 25% challenge and 75 to 80% nourishment, right? And, and this nourishment thing is such a big deal. Uh, I saw this last week. Uh, as longtime believers in Jesus and longtime church people came up to me and gave me hugs and said, I really needed to hear that. And said things to me like, you know what, for, forever, for years, I attended church and never felt like I was welcome to come. Thank you for, for letting me know. I never felt worthy. See, this idea that you are welcome no matter what, that Jesus did this for you, and that if you're messed up, there is grace and love and forgiveness here for everyone. This is not a new hope thing. You guys know that, right? Uh, This is a Jesus thing. And don't ever let anyone tell you any different. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you aren't welcome or that you can't come. You are always welcome at the table of God. 
There's a couple simple verses from Luke 22 as Jesus initiates and institutes this practice. And these are going to be our foundation. We talked about them last week. We're going to see them for a second this week. Uh, You've probably heard these or at least heard them alluded to dozens and maybe hundreds of times throughout your life if you've grown up in church. But I, I want to encourage you, hide these in your heart. Maybe memorize them. They're very simple. So here's what our Lord said and did with his closest followers as he rolled rolled this out. We see this in Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. It says, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, he gave them bread to eat as a representation of his body that was about to be broken for them in the forgiveness of their sins. And he says, Do this. Do this often, and as you do it, remember me. Do it in remembrance of me. We experienced this today, didn't we? We experienced this. We did it maybe a little differently than usual. And I think today, at the end, we're going to learn why Jesus kind of encourages this practice often, that we have some measure of frequency with which we engage in this practice. And then the text continues like this. It says, In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, uh, uh, this uh, cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And so they shared wine as a representation of Jesus' blood that was about to be shed for them and the forgiveness of their sins. And we're going to lean a little bit more into that next week, but this idea of bloodshed is important. It's meaningful. But Jesus adds confusion to this already probably peculiar practice by letting him know that, that this terrible, difficult thing uh, like bloodshed was going to happen, but it wasn't him going out like a warrior to make things right. It was actually him allowing his blood to be shed for you and for me so that we could be forgiven. The new covenant. This is my new, better way to deal with you. I will die so that the price is paid and that you can have life now and forever. No more sacrifices. And that's cool, right? I mean, it's cool that Jesus did this for us. Does that fire anyone else up? Right? Because we should never come to this table just like, oh, well, right? (laughs) That was tasty bread, Rob. Right? No, it's got to be more than that. It's got to be more. No more sacrifices. This is amazing. Best gift ever. But who's it for? Is it just for his closest followers? Is it just for those who get it the most right? We, we talked about this, right? No, it's for you and it's for me. And it's for everyone who would set down their pride, approach the table, and come to Jesus. And so this week and next week, we're going to take a look at the the two simple common elements that we find on the table and 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 that are a part of this meal and i want to i want to talk about them in ways that i hope encourage us to to feel the weight of them and to think about them differently maybe to infuse them with a little extra meaning than we typically think of and so god today i pray that this meal and this message would nourish us and challenge us to more. God, may coming to your table and and receiving this meal always do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's the first thing we find on the table? Right? So we have the bread here. The bread. Now, this bread is simple, right? It's just bread. It's, it's tasty. We always like to, to have tasty bread for communion here at New Hope. It's one of our things. So, so what does Jesus tell us that this bread represents? His body. Very, very simple, right? And then what does he say that, that is going to happen to his body for you and for me? It's going to be broken, right? There, that, that it's not going to remain whole. It's going to, it's going to be broken. That's, that's the picture we see here. And so there, there are really two things I want us to get today as we think about the bread and as we think about Jesus' body. And the first one is found in John chapter 6. And I want to show you some verses here. John 6, 48 
through 51, here's how the text starts. Jesus begins with this declaration. He says, yes, I am the bread of life. He says, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. So Jesus, again, makes this important declaration, which makes sense, right? Because we all need to eat in order to sustain life, right? I'm the bread of life. You're hungry, you need bread, you get bread, you eat bread, you, you live a little bit longer. This makes sense. But what Jesus does here is he takes this important historic moment in, in the life of the history of the people of God where, where the Lord himself provided bread from heaven for his people and Jesus points out that all the people that received this bread from God in the wilderness all have one thing in common, Right? They're dead. They, and, 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 you know, this, for some of us, if you're, like, really tired, this might be encouraging for others. It might, like, at one point in history, we're all going to have that very same thing in common, too, right? It's like at some point, everybody shares this. And so Jesus is telling this, but, but Jesus wants it to be crystal clear that he himself is not just any bread. Or any bread that God himself even dropped from the sky. He is different he is special. He is better. And then watch how the text continues. Jesus said, anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. And then he says again with this emphasis, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So you eat that otherwise awesome bread. What happens? You still die. Right? Like all of your, your ancestors ate that bread from God. And that bread is just fine for physical life, but this new bread offers eternal life both now and forever. Receive this bread and your life changes now. Receive this bread and even when you die physically, that is not the end of you. You have eternal life forever. And oh, by the way, in case you missed it the first time I said it, this bread, this offer is only and always found in me, Jesus says. You can't get this bread anywhere else. And then watch how the, this passage concludes. We see these words. Jesus says, anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, uh, which I will offer so the world may live, in case you missed it, is my flesh. So a third time now, back to back to back. Eternal life for anyone who eats this bread is my offer to you, Jesus said. And oh, by the way, this, uh, this bread is my very flesh. And we can take that super literally, but I think the thing he wants us to hear more than anything is he's, he wants us to know that he's putting more than his words into this, right? It's not Jesus just telling us a bunch of things. He, he's letting us know, I'm going to put my entire life into getting this new life for you. It's more than just talk. It's how I live. So we come to the table and we receive the bread. When we do this, the first thing I want you to see is this. This is simple, but it's powerful. Something necessary that we did not have has been provided. Simple, right? There's something necessary. If we want to live, if we want to have life, both a better life now and eternal life, we need this thing that we don't have. And we can't get and we don't have access to. And yet someone has provided it. Sure, you and I can all go down to the store and buy some pretty amazing bread, right? Uh, if, if maybe, maybe you're like, hey, I'm, I'm between paydays, and I'm out of money. I can't even afford bread. You know what? If you were that hungry, some, someone else could probably get you bread, or if it got to the point, you might even, and I'm not encouraging this, be able to steal a loaf of bread if your survival depended on it. And that would sustain your physical life just fine, for as long as your physical life lasted, but when your physical life was done, it would be done. And so uh, are we unless we receive this eternal life-giving meal. We can't earn it. 
There's no place to buy it. And the only source for it is Jesus. And everyone needs it if they want true life before death and an eternal life after death as well. So this is an insane, priceless gift here that was given for you. Jesus gives this this unbelievable gift. And so again, I just want to encourage you, because I don't know, I don't know how you do this or how you feel sometimes. Sometimes it, it might just be like, well, okay, Rob finished talking, and, we, and when we have communion, sharing the Lord's Supper, we come and we do it just because that's what we do, right? It becomes a normal practice, a ritual, a routine. And I just want to encourage you, this was the greatest gift ever given. So let's not come to this table in a common way as though this was a common thing taking the significance of this for granted right this is this is like the epitome of the greatest thing if if we did an oprah thing and i said hey everybody i have a million bucks taped underneath the seat of every person in the room how would you feel right (laughs) now i don't there's not even like a dollar under every seat um But man, we should come to this table with way more gratitude than if it was just money or even a pile of money, right? So so that's the first thing I want you to see, that, that when we come to the table, we come to see and experience and receive something that that is far beyond what we could ever provide for ourselves. It is important and necessary, and we could never do it on our own. And so Jesus did it for us. The second thing I want you to see comes from Acts chapter 2, sort of a familiar passage, verses 42 through 47. And I just want to read these words over you. Listen to this passage, of kind of talking about the early days of the early church. The text says this, All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity." all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So just just quickly, I want to show you just six principles here from those those verses that marked the the early church. One is is the devotion principle. Do you see that? How that that started, right? It said, uh, when you think about the devotion principle, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. See, they were devoted to the apostles, the teaching of the apostles, to each other, their fellowshipping, and and to God, right? As they they commune with Him and as they talk to Him in prayer. This is something they are devoted to. They're probably a little bit more devoted than, than, than we are, right? Like, not like today. It's like, man, I'm devoted. Until I disagree or don't feel like it or decide I don't like you anymore. Like, this was with our lives serious. We also, in the text, see what, what I like to call the awe principle, right? The awe principle. The next verse says, a deep sense of awe came over them, awe and wonder, uh, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. So this, this church thing, this faith thing, this living for Jesus thing was not just some common, ordinary, maybe sometimes boring, do it if you want to part of life. It seems like the people here in the early church were like kids on Christmas, right? They were just filled with wonder. Their eyes were wide. They were so excited what God was doing. And they should be, right? I mean, these miraculous things were going on. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they feel this way? God was there and he was working. But is God not here? And is God not working? And should we not have the same sense of awe and wonder. The next principle we see is the unity 
principle. The next verse said, And the, the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They met together. They, they, met, they, they met together in one place. They were one. And not just in words, but with their lives, right? Uh, if, if you need something I have, it's yours. Here you go. I, I mean, we're, we're together like that, right? We, we have this kind of unity, don't we? Like what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine? No? No, we don't? Uh, not so much? Not, not unless things are perfect? I mean, I just asked Tom Cogarty if I could borrow his Harley. He said no. You know, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but then he asked me for my bike and I said no, so we're kind of both in the same place, right? Um, and, 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 and you know what? If that's not challenging, it's like, well, you know, if, if, if it's my used one or my secondhand one or whatever, then maybe I would be that kind of, you, you know, I, we could have unity. But I don't know. It's my good one, Rob. And I use that. And I, I kind of, like, we have all these great things we say to explain this away. This gets more challenging. Watch this. The next one's the generosity principle. The text says this. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. See, this is so much more than you can use what I have and I can use what you have. This goes all the way to say that, guess what? If I have something of value and you need something that none of us have, I will sell my thing of value so that we can get you what you need. Ouch. I got a message this week from a guy that I know in another country, but I know him. We've shared life together. A year ago when his, when his son needed a life-saving back surgery, Bethany and I gave money toward that. Now a year later, one of the, the pieces in his back broke. And they need to get to another country and have emergency surgery. And there was the, the request that came. And if I'm being honest, I, I read it. And I skipped over it fairly quickly. I mean, I give. I give above and beyond. I'm, I'm a generous person. But I have to be reasonable, right? I have to be responsible. There's things I need to, to look after as well. And I just want you to hear this. Here in the early church, they were extravagant with their generosity. Even to people they didn't know at all who were in need. The last principle kind of in this category is what I call the doing life together principle. Verse 46 says they worshiped together in the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. See, they met daily. They worshiped daily. Some of them actually lived together communally. I've heard people say this before. I've heard them say, one of the things that causes the local church to be powerful is that, that every single week we get together. Every single week we have an opportunity to get on the same page, to experience Jesus, to be filled back up, and to go out together on mission. Right? This is one of the powerful things. If we met monthly or yearly, we wouldn't have the same ability to get traction and have power. But what if you took that once a week thing and gave it a multiplier of six, right? What if we said, now I'm, I'm, I, I'm kind of busy a lot of the rest of the week, but, but what if we just say, hey, we're going to meet daily. If part of the power in the church is that we meet weekly, what happens when you live like this? And here's the payoff. Here's what happens if you and I live like this. It's the last principle, and I call it the, the favor principle. And verse 40, 47 says, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill or the favor of all the people, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. They had favor and goodwill with people and with God. Anybody else want that? Right? Now, sometimes we think that opposition and even persecution is a sign that we're doing things right because then we're opposed. And that certainly can be true and is, is true. But I think uh, another sign that we're doing things right is just uncommon favor and goodwill that we could never earn in and of ourselves that God gives us with all people. So, 
come to the end of those, and, and, and maybe some of you are thinking, well, Rob, that's cool and maybe even helpful, but, but what's the point? What does this have to do with the table and the bread? Because remember, Jesus told us, I'm going to do more than just put my words in this for you. I'm going to put my very life into this for you. I'm going to allow my body to be broken for you. And so when we come to the table and we receive the bread, here's the second thing I want you to see, and it's found in a common saying. Have you ever heard this? You are what you eat, right? And I just want to confess, I'm a little bit ticked off because on my way home from the woods yesterday evening, I really wanted to be a nacho cheese Dorito Loco Taco Supreme, Um, but I just became a Dorito Loco Taco because they messed up my order. It didn't put the tomato and sour cream on those things. So, you know, pray for me. I don't know why it's so hard. I don't understand. Jesus gave his body to be broken for us, to pay the price that we couldn't Hey, that's amazing, but that isn't the end. See, what else is called the body of Christ other than the body of Christ? Us, the church, you and me. This is also called the body of Christ. And so when we come to the table and when we eat this bread, we're not only receiving the gift of life and love and forgiveness, we're also agreeing to be and become these things. We're agreeing to be and become part of his body. See, he gave his body to pay the price. It was the only thing that could pay the price. It was the only thing that could settle the debt. But what does that mean? His body was given. This is why you and I are his hands and feet. It's why we, church, are his body. It's the idea that he died for me, and so I'm going to live for him. We love the priceless gift, don't we? But we bristle at the call to be and become more. I love coming and getting grace and love and forgiveness. But then I'm supposed to go and do and be more than I currently am? Let me take just one of the characteristics that we just talked about to examine us. The first one was devotion, right? They were devoted. They were devoted to the apostles, to the apostles' teaching, to each other, to the breaking of bread. And so sometimes you might say, well, Rob, what about us? How, how are we doing? And I'm including me in this. Uh, how, do, do you think we're devoted? And I would say, absolutely, I think we're devoted. We're devoted to our God and to our friends and our family and to our needs and our hobbies and our technology and our cars and our houses and our intellectual development and our favorite sports team, and I could go on and on and on and on, right? And, and when you and I are devoted to so many things, answer this with me, what exactly are we devoted to? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, right? If you are devoted to everything, then you are devoted to nothing. But don't worry It was just a few chapters into Acts after we see these amazing characteristics that people are now lying about their giving because they're ticked that some people are giving a lot. So they say they're going to give a lot too, but they hold some secretly back. Doesn't turn out well for them, by the way. Um, So they're lying about their giving. There's less and less community. People aren't living together. And we get to the point fairly quickly where the persecution strikes and the church is scattered. See, they leaked. Spiritual entropy is real, isn't it? That we start out high and full and things diminish over time. Now, if things were going to be at their best, you may think that Jesus would be the person most able to pull this off, right? But even as he's setting up this practice of communion, as he mentions that the person who was going to betray him, their hand was on the same table along with his. Watch what happens. Here's what the text says in in Luke uh, 22, verses 23 and 24. The disciples began to ask each other, which of them would ever do such a thing? Oh, can't be you. Can't be me. Oh, right? And, And watch this. Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest. Not me. I'd never. Well, what do you mean by that? Why would you never? Well, I'm way better than you. No, you're not. I'm better than you, right? Like right in this moment when things should have been at their pinnacle, they're arguing with each other about who was better 
and who is more deserving. The fact that they started to lose it just after they got it in the early church and right here with Jesus points to something that you and I need to remember because we are terrible at this too. We need to continue to receive and rely on the, pr- the priceless gift of Jesus moment by moment. We need to rely on this day by day if we want to be a part of his gift to the world. Because I think the Bible bears out, we can't do this. The people right with Jesus couldn't do it. They were arguing right away, right? The body wasn't about unity. It was about division and argument and who was better. The early church were all together. And then again, a few verses later, it seems like everything falls apart. Have you ever felt like that with your own family? with other people of faith, you're like, are you serious? Like, why are we fighting again about that? And so here's the truth. We need him. We can't do any of this on our own. This is why Jesus says, do this often and remember me. It doesn't mean we need to to, to pour a cup of wine or juice and, and get a loaf of bread and do this all the time. What it means is that every day, every minute, We need to be relying on the presence of Jesus in our lives in order for us to be able to go out and be his hands and feet in the gift he wants us to be to this world. When we do that, when we follow this pattern, everything is different. And so, Father, today, I just want to pray for us. God, today I want to ask in the name of Jesus that that you, you would help us. God, I thank you for the truth of the scriptures that teach us that, that no, none of us, that no man should live by bread alone. But God, we, we should live by, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And in fact, we should live by feeding on the eternal word that became flesh that we call Jesus Christ. So God, I just pray for us two very simple things. God, that you would help us to receive your gift. God, may none of us ever think we, we, we can earn this or do this or afford this or buy this in our own strength. But God, may we come to you humbly because we desperately need what only you have, what only you are, and what only you provide. But God, help us to see that it's not just enough to receive, to eat, this bread of life. But God, may we be what we eat. May we become what we eat. God, may we receive your body and may we become your body as a blessing to those around us and to our world. So God, help us to receive the gift and help us to give the gift, knowing that if we were to do these two simple things, it changes everything. It makes everything different. May this be true in our lives today and this very week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.